Marshall Lecture in Public Philosophy, which is also a collaboration of St. Mary's Department of Philosophy, the Roland Marshall Public Philosophy Lecture Fund, and Susanna. I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Office of the Vice President, Academic Research, Dr. David Gauthier's office. SACEPA's mandate is to provide an arena for critical thinking, public discussion, and research into current ethical challenges in society. As the public outreach arm of our founding institutions, SACEPA does this by presenting public lectures, conversations, and discussions, which are designed to inform the debate, facilitate informed choices, and mediate ethical concerns through a process of critical listening and engagement. And in a few moments, we'll do exactly that with Dr. Ian Kerr. But before I get there, I'd also like to welcome our live stream audience tonight and invite you to join in on the question and answer period at the end. You can do that through the chat screen um, on your screen. And you can also evaluate our program tonight. There's a feature there, a tool to provide us with feedback, which is uh, very helpful for SACEPA. And for our live audience here, you'll have evaluation forms in front of you. Just take a few minutes. It really helps us uh, inform our future programming so that we can do the best that we can do on these discussions. And I also hope that you'll join us following the presentation for a reception that we have planned up in the lobby. So now I'll call on Dr. Lisa Gannett, Professor of Philosophy here at St. Mary's University, to formally introduce our speaker for this evening. It is truly my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Ian Kerr. Dr. Kerr is Canada Research Chair in Ethics, Law, and Technology at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law. He is also cross-appointed to the Faculty of Medicine and Department of Philosophy. Ian has been straddling these areas since I knew him during the 1990s at the University of Western Ontario, where he graduated with an MA and PhD in Philosophy and a Law degree. Combined with an undergraduate degree in biology and philosophy from the University of Alberta, he has been well equipped in his career to engage a host of interesting questions in such diverse areas as bioethics, health policy, philosophy of technology, and philosophy of law. Given Dr. Kerr's contributions to current debates over such timely topics as digital rights, privacy, and privacy on the internet, privacy and health records, privacy concerning neuroimaging for lie detection in court, online surveillance of tweens by marketers, uh, lots of stuff, artificial intelligence, transhumanism. He seemed an ideal person to invite to give the Marshall Lecture on Public Philosophy. Add to that his contribution to debate outside the academy by publishing pieces in news media, for example, on privacy and Facebook settings, uh, searches by sniffer dogs, and the assumptions of two-leggedness as the norm for Olympic racing as challenged by Oscar Pistorius, prosthetic limb, limbs, the first time we heard about Pistorius, at least in the news. <laughs> Add to that my memory of him as a generous, witty, intelligent, imaginative, passionate, and gregarious fellow student, and I have no doubt we are in for a wonderful experience this evening. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was a very kind and generous introduction. That was the kind of introduction that if my mom was here with us in the room tonight, uh, she would definitely appreciate. And if my dad was here in the room with us, he'd actually believe. Um, <laughs> so it's great to be here and to be uh, honored with the, the Marshall Lecture in Public Philosophy. And I want to start by thank, thanking Professor Roland uh, Marshall for, the in, for, for, for doing everything that you do in, to make this series happen. Um, I think one great thing about this series, having sort of consumed some of them on YouTube myself, uh, is probably the idea that people from away, I think that's the way you say it, um, <laughs> people from away get the opportunity to come here and participate in this wonderful community. But the other thing about it is just the fact that it is about communities and public engagement. And I think most of us in the room who are in the philosophy, in philosophy departments recognize that there's just not quite enough community engagement. Socrates kind of had the idea a while back, but then Plato sort of brought it into the academy. And so it's nice to be here um, for this lecture. I'd also like to make a quick thanks to, uh, to Todd Calder and to Lisa Gannett for the invitations, and of course uh, to Chris Stover and, and to, uh, especially to, to Katie Merwin for, uh, for all of your help in, in getting me here and, and all of that sort of thing. So 
you can see you can see my title and my topic uh, there. And I guess I don't quite know how to phrase my problem. On the one hand, it can be nothing at all. On the other hand, it can be the end of humanity. <laughs> I start off by paying great homage to. Um, Isaac Asimov, who imagined this flourishing world in which robots would cooperate with humans. Now, unfortunately, I think what you'll see th through at least part of this uh, lecture that I'm giving is that the history of robotics and artificial intelligence actually tends to focus on the competition between them rather than their cooperation. Let's take a look and see how we fare in that competition. Welcome back. Ken, you've got your signaling device ready, I see. Here are the categories for you to select from in Double Jeopardy. First off, Etude Brute. Next, Hedgehog Podge. Don't worry about it. The Art of the Steel. Cambridge. And finally, Church and State, with each of those words in quotation marks. Start us off. Let's try Don't Worry About It all the way down at 2,000, Alex. It's just acne. You don't have this skin infection, also known as Hansen's disease. Watson. What is leprosy? You are right. Attitude brute for 1600. Music fans wax rhapsodic about this Hungarian's transcendental etudes. Watson. Who is Franz Liszt? You are right. Don't worry about it for 1600. You're just a little stiff. You don't have this painful mosquito-borne joint illness with a Swahili name. Watson? What is dengue fever? Dengue fever, correct. Attitude brute for 1,200. Paganini's 24 Capricci set the standard for etudes for this instrument. Watson? What is violin? Good. 2,000, same category. From 1911 to 1917, this romantic Russian composed etude tableau for piano. Watson? Who is Rachmaninoff? Rachmaninoff is correct, and that adds to your lead. You're at 13,400. Go again. Don't worry about it. For 1,200. You just need a little more sun. You don't have this hereditary lack of pigment. Watson. What is albinism? Good. Cambridge for 1,600. Answer, <laughs> daily double. What are you going to wager? I'll wager $6,435. I won't ask. I won't ask. Here's the clue for you, Watson. The chapels at Pembroke and Emmanuel Colleges were designed by this architect. Who is Sir Christopher Wren? You are right, and that adds to your total. Okay, you see the IBM team, they're very happy with Watson's performance. And, you know, what I love about this clip and, and watching the whole series is, you know, Watson kind of takes on this human-esque form. We really, I, I remember viscerally cheering for Watson. Uh, and meanwhile, the, the two champions of Jeopardy seem a bit robotic to me in a kind of way. So anyways, is it robots one, humans nothing? Well, no, not at least according to IBM. This um, was something much bigger, uh, a much bigger deal than, in fact, when IBM in 1997 uh, beat the grand master of chess, Gary Kasparov, um, and fell in line with beating Turing's prediction of when a machine uh, would beat a human being at chess. Um, but the thing that's probably most relevant to say, if, if you hadn't sort of followed what was going on with Watson in the Jeopardy challenge, is that this was about cracking the barrier where machine systems could do natural language processing. And so, you know, when it was back in the days of playing chess, we think of computers as pretty good at that kind of stuff. They're good at mathematical modeling, they can crunch numbers. But as you see, Jeopardy is a game that has a lot of twists. It's built on puns and, and all sorts of things in natural language. So this was a pretty big deal. Um, but it was also a big deal because, really, IBM had other things in mind, as you could tell if you followed the media the next day. This particular ad was in the Globe and Mail. It was a full-page ad the day after Watson won. And it, these ads like this were, would appear in key locations around the globe. And what we see is that if you, re if you read it, what it talks about is the fact that Watson will now be used to solve some of what IBM calls the world's most enticing challenges in healthcare, in finance, in law, 
and more recently in academia. Uh, the University of Toronto Faculty of Law students just put together uh, a bit of software that rides on top of the Watson uh, uh, platform and they are trying to basically build a super intelligent attorney as they call it. The idea would be that you can apply that natural language processing. Watson can read every law journal and pretty quickly. Watson can read every internet thing about the law that there is and can run its algorithms, test its confidence levels as you saw, and make certain kinds of predictions or answer certain kinds of questions in a legal way kind of in, as a corollary to what it was doing uh, on Jeopardy. So these are, I think, very interesting developments. And I'm going to just play one more video for you right now. This is IBM's vision of what Watson is and what Watson is about. I believe Watson has the potential to transform many industries. There's so much content out there. Information overload is really the problem of our day in many ways. There's lots of data out there. Now the trick is, how do you get intelligence out of it, not just noise? We decided that we needed to build a system using our Power 7 series that could extract knowledge at a much faster rate from enormous amounts of data than human beings or any other computer system can do. Watson represents a way to look at all this data and extract the needle in the haystack, the key insight that's useful. While it's playing the game show Jeopardy as its test case, there are lots of other domains where people want questions answered. Healthcare is certainly one of those places. Suppose you're a clinician, a doctor, a nurse trying to diagnose a very complex case. You have some ideas, um, but in order to confirm your hypothesis, you need a lot of information. So many different kinds of information to consider, from journals and abstracts, which are new information that's coming out daily, to classic reference books, to specifics about a particular case history. The amount of valid, useful information that will make a difference in a patient's life, uh, it just has exploded to the extent that it's impossible to keep up with that. So we need tools that glean the best of that. And most of the data, if you will, on how a patient's doing is in natural language, not coded data. And I think that plays to the strength of Watson. In seconds, doctors everywhere in the world are going to be able to find out what are the best treatments and how do I ensure best outcomes. That's just one example of how we hope to revolutionize entire industries with this new capability. Business people would say we can make things more productive, more efficient, more optimized. Others would say uh, we can address some real societal issues. It's limitless, the number of things you could potentially apply this to. And it changes the paradigm in which we work with computers. Life is really about questions and answers. But Watson can now help us get some of those answers and make us smarter individually, which will then create a smarter planet. And everybody lived happily ever after, right? Uh, this is actually someone who was not too happy. This is Ken Jennings, who, who was who the, the, the champion, all-time champion of uh, Jeopardy. And this is his final answer in Final Jeopardy on the last night of the match after um, him and his other human colleague got cleaned up off the floor by Watson. And uh, if, you, if you read underneath his answer, who is Stoker, uh, you see that he writes in brackets, I for one welcome our new computer overlords. This, um, you know, so every utopia, as IBM presents it, has an equal and opposite dystopia, and that didn't go unnoticed by, by Jennings. So that phrase, I think it's worth pointing out, was popularized on a 1994 Simpsons episode in which Kent Brockman, the local news anchor, mistakenly believed that the Earth was being taken over by a powerful race of ants. And fearing for his life, he announced on, on the show, I, for one, welcome our new ant or new insect overlords, which is itself a reference to from 1977 to H.G. Wells. Uh, in any event, what we start to see here is that Watson's successes really raise questions about the role that humans will occupy as robots and uh, AIs are capable of performing a multitude of tasks that were traditionally uh, in the hands of human experts and performing them well. And so we start to see what happens going on there and I want to sort of dig into this a little bit. This, uh, the, the popular uh, culture insight that we get in, in Ken Jennings' remarks 
has deeper roots in the academy. And as an example, I want to talk for the next several minutes about an important publication that this young professor of mathematics from the University of California at Berkeley um, published. And here, here's what he says, and, and I'm going to read a few passages because I think it's worth us really trying to think about this. He says, first, let us postulate that the computer scientists succeed in developing intelligent machines that can do all things better than human beings can do them. In that case, presumably all the work will be done by vast, highly organized systems of machines, and no human effort will be necessary. Either, one, uh, either of two cases might occur, he says. The machines might be permitted to, take, to make all of the decisions on their own without human oversight, or else human control over machines will be retained. So he sets it up for us uh, in this kind of way. And I want to sort of dig down deeper into what he says about these things. So on the first uh, lemma, uh, he says machines will be permitted to make all the, all the decisions. Or more generally, that they'll be permitted to make important decisions. What he says there is that people uh, will let machines make more of their decisions for them simply because machine-made decisions will bring about better results than human-made ones. Eventually, a stage will be reached which the decisions necessary to keep the system running will be so complex that human beings will be incapable of making them intelligently. At that stage, mach machines will be in effective control. And I think it's interesting to sort of point this out because this kind of thinking isn't the dominant discourse that we see when, when we hear about intelligence machines. Newspaper articles, even the CBC today, uh, wanted to lead with basically the Terminator type scenario, the idea of the machine uprising. But that's not what's going on here, at least not in, not in, in this lemma uh, of the description of what might happen if we start delegating things to intelligent machines. What he wants to say is that we drift into a kind of state uh, of dependence uh, and we'll have no practical cho uh, choice but to do what the machines decide. And so it's interesting, I want to think about this later with some examples, uh, but first let's talk about the other scenario that he imagines. In the second case, what he says is that human controls over the machines will be retained. Okay? This would, of course, be in the language that I'm using in, in the title of my uh, presentation, this would be a decision not to lim relinquish control to the machines. And on, on this front, here's what he says. He says, the average person may have control over certain private machines of their own, such as a car or a personal computer, but control over the larger systems of machines will be in the hands of a tiny elite, just as today but with two differences. Due to improved techniques, the elite will have greater control over the masses. And because human work will no longer be necessary, the masses will be superfluous, a useless burden on the system. Now, although I think there's a bit of a false dichotomy happening here in this reasoning that he's putting forward, I do think the vision that, that's being put forward is compelling in some ways and at least worthy of our consideration. And I, I, I took a look through the notes uh, that built up uh, the arguments behind this. And I just wanted to say to you now that this rather long passage that I've read to you is in fact uh, derived from a very meticulous set of notes that ultimately became a manuscript. And it's kind of interesting to know who wrote them. You remember this person? This is Theodore, Professor Theodore Kaczynski, the Unabomber, right? And now, I'm, I'm not an apologist for Theodore Kaczynski. His bombs killed three people in a 17-year period when he was trying to fight against technology and wounded many others. He injured and killed many people in the technology community, in key, in, including people who I admire and whose work I've known for many, many years. And he did so uh, alongside of some of the words that I've written which have come from his Unabomber manifesto. Now, the questions that he raised, I have to admit, have plagued me a little bit since I first read them uh, when I read through his Industrial Society in the Future back in 1999. It's a while ago now. But I, I think rather than dismissing them, I thought that tonight maybe it's kind of interesting to actually see how this all plays out um, in some of the things that are going on. So the two questions I'd kind of like to pose um, and, and, and talk about for tonight, and things that I've written and published on with a colleague of mine by the name of Jason Miller, who's a philosopher and engineer, uh, are these. The first question is, what is our justification when we relinquish control and delegate human decision-making tasks to machines? And second, how does the, that first question 
uh, bring to bear on determinations about responsibility in cases of human disagreement with the machines and undesirable outcomes that, that follow from that. I know these questions sound a bit strange, um, but bear with me, uh, please. You know, she who would learn to fly one day must first learn to stand and walk and run and climb and dance. One cannot fly into flying. Rule to self. Uh, always quote Nietzsche when feeling a little bit awkward in front of an audience. Um, okay, anyways, what I want to say here is, having written about this, um, is that uh, we suggest in, in some of our work that given the normative pull that we think comes along with evidence-based practice, which dominates and tends to dominate uh, our thinking these days, we are going to be in a situation where we find ourselves hard-pressed to find reasons to remain in control of the decisions uh, that are generated by intelligent machines. That's, that's, we're entertaining that, that thesis and we think it's rather compelling. Uh, if instead uh, we choose to remain in control, we might deliberately be advocating a status quo in which humans deliver less than optimal outcomes, all other things equal, to what the machines might have done. But like Asimov's world coordinator, who I quoted at the beginning of the talk, it's not immediately clear uh, whether either of these decisions is anything to worry about at all, or, at the end, or, or, or ultimately if it's the end of humanity. Either way, we think it's our responsibility, uh, responsibility to face these questions. So in starting to think about this, I mean, human experts, when we think of relying on a human being as the expert upon which to base decision making, um, we tend to think of them as performing pretty complex and sometimes unpredictable tasks. And there's an entire uh, literature in sociology on the sociology of expertise. And it tends to focus, uh, to some extent at least, on this notion of under, philosophers use this word a lot too, of underdetermination. Uh, in delineating the people who are experts from non-experts. And that human experts aren't really fully able to describe in some cases what their actions are in formulating their expertise in, in, in the sense of giving you know, hard, fast rules. And that plays a, a big understanding of the role of, of, of the sociology of expertise. In any event, we're moving into a world where we don't always rely so much on experts as in human experts but we're starting to rely more and more on expert systems like Watson, who I showed you before. So these kinds of, of, of machines um, cannot also, also cannot be fully understood uh, by reference to their lines of code in the same way that, that you can't follow rules for people, especially given the vast number of potential inputs of data. Every medical journal, in, in this case, every health blog, uh, every clinical trial, every clinical outcome, Indeed, everything on the internet, all of those things could go into a Watson-type machine in the future. And this opens the door, in, at least in some sense, to describing experts alongside, or sorry, of describing expert systems alongside the notion uh, of an expert, in the sense that we might at some point allow them the same kind of knowledge monopoly uh, that we tend to give to human beings in some situations. And one of the things that's important to know and, and think about in all of this is that these machine systems, uh, unlike more simple mechanical machines or even more simple digital machines, they are intentionally uh, unpredictable. They are unpredictable by design. And so we can just, uh, if I can follow up with a quick example from Watson, if so, how many people actually watched that when that was happening on TV in Jeopardy? Anybody in the room? Couple people. You'll remember that sort of, it became, at least within nerd circles, it became sort of a famous moment where um, Alex Trebek uh, asked um, the question, uh, or gave the clue, I guess you would say. It's the largest airport. It, it, its largest airport is named for a World War II hero, its second for a World War II battle. And, and Watson buzzed in to answer, and, and, and Watson's answer was, what is Toronto? Which, first of all, was not, certainly is not a United States uh, airport. Uh, and, and, and so what we started to see there was that Watson was unpredictable. And what's important to know, and there's been a lot of discussion, again, in the people who are in the computer science field, that Watson did not malfunction when Watson made that, that choice. Watson got it wrong. Watson was incorrect. But Watson did not malfunction. And what we start to see is what makes these machines so efficacious in the long run by way of big data and analytics and algorithms 
is precisely that it's unpredictable by design. And what I mean by that is that unpredictability is a feature in the machine, not a bug. And that's kind of important when you think about it and you think about what seems to be going on here. Places like Wired Magazine were really pushing um, some work and some thinking around a, an idea or concept that's called the end of theory. And this is a way of sort of putting, you know, big data analytics ahead of theory. And, you know, we philosophers don't tend to like that too much. Uh, anybody in the academy doesn't tend to like that too much. But just in case you've sort of never heard of this debate about the end of theory, and I'm not meaning to make a comment on the debate itself one way or the other. Um, what, that, what people who are proponents of this particular point of view are trying to suggest is that more and more what matters are the outcomes, whether the outcomes provide some form of utility. And if that utility is sufficiently high, we don't care how it came about, how, 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 how whatever decision maker, or in this case machine, came about getting the answer. And that may sound kind of weird in the context of what we do as academics, but if you think about what you'd also do a lot as academics is when you're trying to think about something, you hop onto your computer and you go to Google. And Google's algorithm is, couldn't be exactly described by this, right? The idea is that even those who know the secret sauce, you know, those who have, are privy to the code of, of Google's search algorithms, um, couldn't necessarily in any case ever predict the Google outcome of a search, uh, you know, without having known it in advance or seen it in advance. And so what we start to see here is that as we move into using these kinds of uh, supercomputing techniques uh, in, 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 in an era that has, uh, is, continues to be called big data, what we start to see is there's less emphasis on the theoretical way of getting there, exactly the opposite of we academics do, and much more emphasis on the outcomes. And if there's enough success with the outcomes, we just tend to trust the algorithm. And so what we start to see here is the development of a particular kind of faith. Uh, a new kind of faith, I would suggest, something that is kind of an uh, interesting flip uh, of the one that Robert Piercig used to talk about in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, some of you may remember, when he used to refer to the academy as the Church of Reason. And right now, the faith is no longer placed in the Church of Reason in that traditional sense, but rather we're starting to place that faith instead in the power of algorithms in algorithms we trust, um, but only so long as they continue to work. Uh, and it's a weird kind of uh, play also on a, on, on a Hume and David Hume's sort of skepticism, but now here with robots. So what I've said so far about this is that the emphasis is on the level of success that these um, machines are capable uh, of doing and that to some extent that is seen as evidence-based practice. We can look at the success records and then we decide do we want to adopt these uh, based on their success or not. And if there's good evidence to suggest that a particular action uh, produces the most favorable outcome, then we tend more and more these days to be sympathetic to policy decisions in favor of those kinds of machine outcomes. So uh, that becomes really interesting when you start to think about what Watson's real job was, which isn't to play a few games of Jeopardies and have fun with Alex Trebek. Um, the first application that IBM, as you saw from the little clip that I told you about, was to go into the field of medicine. And what we saw not too long after, about a year after Watson started doing this, is headlines like this one where it says that IBM's Watson is now better at diagnosing and treating cancer uh, than human doctors. So it becomes interesting to think about all of this stuff and for me, as someone who's interested in a lot, largely the ethical ramifications of allowing these machines to do these kind of things like diagnose cancer um, and other sorts of things, one of the things that I think we're going to have to confront in our very near-term future is what happens in cases of what we might call human-robot disagreement, right? What should we do when the computers tell us to do one thing and it is our instinct perhaps to do something else? That's not an actual problem yet. And one of the reasons is because we're still at a stage where from a policy perspective, we are very much more comfortable uh, in situations where we leave the human being in the loop.
right? So IBM has been very good and very careful, for example, to talk about Watson as an instrument in medicine. It's an instrument, it's a tool that doctors can use. The human is in the loop, the doctor is the ultimate decision maker, um, and the most responsible physician can utilize these tools in one way or another. Um, and that is really sort of the thing that keeps us feeling safe about this uh, in kind of a different way than the world that Asimov imagined, where he thought that rules that were actually hardwired into the machines were the things that would allow us to have some kind of trust. For now, we still don't have that level of trust unless we keep the human being in the loop. But what we're starting to see is that we're also, uh, so I want to give you an example of a technology where the, where the human is still in the loop, first of all, and then I'm going to talk about other scenarios. It's pretty amazing stuff to watch if you haven't seen stuff like this. So that's you know one of the promo bits for the Da Vinci surgical robot. That robot is still human controlled at this point. Um, but you know the idea behind it is supposed to be that by virtue of doing co-robotics, human plus machine, you can get a level of precision that you just can't get uh, in surgery. I've heard surgeons who completely disagree with that, and that's not surprising, is it? Um, but in any event, there's also the other thing to keep in mind is right now there are a number of lawsuits pending against uh, uh, the, the owners of Da Vinci for, for surgeries that have gone wrong as well. But where we're moving with all of this is actually, in fact, to remove uh, the, the human surgeon out of the equation. And we're sort of already there with sort of different examples. One that you can just go on YouTube and take a look at is examples that sort of in phlebotomy, like, right, so you go and you get blood taken but it's taken by a robot where other than sort of turning the machine, the device on and calibrating it in a particular way, it just sort of does everything. And I was watching that video and I had a sort of visceral reaction to it because the, the, the device maker of that particular thing that took blood was Epson. And some of you might remember that name as sort of a, a, a few years back. They were big in printers. And I remember when I was in grad school, um, I had an Epson printer, and I just had this visceral image when I used to remember those printer jams and what they were like back then with those sort of dot matrix printers, right? So it's a little unnerving to sort of, you know, give over this kind of trust to the machine to, to take the human being, if you will, out of the loop. But I do want to now show you just a couple more, feel, uh, a couple more short video clips um, um, as we start to move to take the, the human being out of the loop. I find it interesting, I'm starting to call that music the Google music, where it has a certain pluckiness to it, it has to have a banjo, it has to have a certain happiness to it. Um, in any event, I now bring you Google. <laughs> Different music though. You know, the first drive on public roads is something that we've been thinking about, and every moment has been building towards putting these cars on the roads where we can start learning even more from them. One of the things that the car does very well is figure out exactly the right point on the track to brake, and also trade off between braking and steering. And it's doing this on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. We've made the car hot, we've made the car cold, we've done durability testing, we drive it through a reliability bump track. The basic idea here is also applicable to safety systems. 
if we can have cars that will drive up to the limits and recover if they go past. This is something that could actually help ordinary drivers, for instance, on a slippery road. Getting these cars out into the public and allowing people to react to them, allowing us to see them out there, I think that's a huge deal. And, and most importantly, it's, it's the necessary step to getting them to drive themselves. When we think about safety, when we think about giving people mobility, and then when you start to think longer term about the impact on cities and the ability to reclaim space and to reduce congestion and free up parking, this is something where we can have a huge impact. Okay, so the, the argument for putting these kinds of cars onto the road is that they will in fact be safer than human drivers. These cars don't get tired, they don't get drunk, uh, they don't get distracted in the same kinds of ways, and that they'll ultimately also produce more efficient roadway systems. They know how to read maps without having to look around. Um, they, they also provide access to people who couldn't otherwise drive because of disabilities that they have. And that really there's a lot of things that speak in favor of these cars if they work well. Um, but there's also some very interesting philosophical questions that arise if you just stop and pause and then dig a, a, a layer deeper into what's going on here. I want to remind the philosophers in the room uh, of papers that we used to read uh, by amazing philosophers like Philippa Foote, uh, and she invented uh, this concept of the trolley problem. Uh, it was an idea for those who, who aren't fully aware uh, of that. Uh, it, you, you hear these kind of ideas in, in philosophy all the time. They're called thought experiments. And in this case, they're sometimes put forward to test different moral theories, different f theories of how ethics should work, uh, utilitarianism, etc., etc. And so you can imagine how philosophers think about this. There's a train going down a track, someone standing near... Um, near a switch and they can pull the switch and if they pull the switch the train veers off where it would otherwise um, kill five people and instead kills one person and there's various variations on that. There's two kind of things going on there. Um, one of those kind of things has to do with the difference between direct and indirect action and the other has to do with an evaluation of many lives versus one individual life for example. Well what I want to say is that as we near get nearer and nearer to removing the human from the loop in delegating some of these decisions to machines, what we actually start to see is that the trolley problem is no longer theoretical. There are people at Google who will decide the trolley problem for, 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 for all of us if we let that happen, for example. So uh, my colleague Jason Miller has written extensively about this and I encourage you to look at his work in popular um, journals uh, uh, including Wired magazine um, but also in philosophical journals where he talks about technology as a moral proxy and it's very interesting work but one of the things that has been been done is some empirical evidence or not well some is more anecdotal than deeply empirical but some survey uh, data was collected on what people think on a variation of the trolley problem the problem that he develops he calls the tunnel problem the tunnel problem uh, is a situation where you imagine uh, driving in a ve your vehicle and you're in a tunnel and just before the edge of the tunnel you see that there's a young child on a bike right in the middle of the roadway. And so you really have two choices within the tunnel. The choice is to carry on through at great injury or death to the child on the roadway or to swerve in which case you know yourself are going to go into the tunnel. And that's the kind of choice that a Google car is going to have to, um, there's going to have to be some thought into the design of the algorithms around that kind of thing. And so it's very real. The trolley problem is very real. It is no longer just this interesting thought experiment in philosophy. These are real life problems now. And I'll tell you, it's kind of interesting the results that came back when people were asked about those questions. Interestingly, not, well maybe I'll start with the not surprisingly, there was at least 64% of people um, who, uh, who decided that they were going to carry on forward and you know, save themselves and, and, and whatever gets in the way gets in the way. But 34% of people said um, that they would swerve, they would, they would swerve into um, the, the side of the tunnel. And I'm sure that they were thinking about things like because they were in a car they had an opportunity of survival whether there was otherwise certain death to the child. There's lots of different ways to sort of think through the rationales that people might give to that. But what's interesting is that there was another set of questions that were being talked about in all of this um, about who should be the ones making these choices. Should it be the manufacturers of these vehicles? 
and, and pretty much every big uh, car manufacturer is getting into this in one way or other? Or should it be um, um, the consumer, the person who is going to be the driver of the car? Should there be like default settings like there is all over Facebook and everywhere else where you can choose your algorithmic preferences? Um, or should this be something that's legislated by law? Is this something that goes through a public policy debate whereupon we enact laws to decide these kind of things? And for those of you who are sort of interested, only 12% thought that manufacturers should be uh, the ones to do this. 44% thought that consumers should be the one to do this. And 33% thought that lawmakers should be. But I raise this just to sort of bring up a point that I don't think we usually think about, which is we think about the idea that, yeah, these cars can get pretty good at driving. But we don't think about the fact that there are moral and ethical questions that are baked into and will be baked into uh, the algorithms that we that ultimately carry these things forward. So it's not as straightforwardly obvious, even if the technology was perfect, uh, it's not uh, immediately obvious that this would be a simple choice to move in this direction versus the status quo and or other alternatives that fit somewhere in the middle. So that's one example of a technology where we're moving from taking the human out of the loop, um, from, from you know, removing the steering wheel from a car as Google's car does, other ones keep them in. We'll have to decide, do we want, the hu do we want a kill switch so the human can take back over? There's a million policy choices that would have to happen. But for those of you who don't follow this debate, it's very useful to know that several states in the United States have already passed enabling legislation that would allow driverless vehicles. I'll just give you a quick bit on that. It's kind of uh, uh, nerddom for lawyer types like me. But, um, but so ma most, most jurisdictions, including Canadian jurisdictions, and certainly most states in the United States, have laws about driving and almost all of those jurisdictions require that the operator of a vehicle be a licensed driver and those have meanings that currently just won't work for automated cars. So automated cars couldn't be on the roadway by virtue of those rules unless we change them. When we make the choice to have driverless cars, that will come with law reform. And so all of these kinds of things are on the table in interesting and important ways. And I think it's really important for people who see these cars and they look cool to think more than just about the thing that evidence-based practice would have us think about, which is, oh, well, if they work well, of course we'll do it. If they're more safe, of course we'll do it, because it's not just that simple. I want to take a second example. I'm not going to show video on this. This is just a, a, a shot uh, of uh, another technology uh, that is actually this and the Google car are kind of neck and neck in terms of the most relevant technologies in terms of the fact that they are near to midterm possibilities for us, like in our lifetimes for sure, everybody's lifetimes in this room. Uh, that's, that's the thinking on this. So this is, um, this is a, 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 a military robot in short, um, but where we're going now, we, we obviously, as you would well know, we have all sorts of what we might call semi-autonomous lethal weapons. Right? So, for example, we have drones, uh, which they, they can't do everything themselves yet, but they do a lot of stuff themselves, and they have a, uh, a, human, a human operator. But the goal, at least for many uh, people developing these technologies, and certainly for a lot of people who are buying these technologies, think the Advanced Research Agency uh, of the United States uh, Department of Defense, DARPA, um, a lot of the goals these days are thinking about how do we make these things so that they can run on their own? How do we take the human out of the loop? And the next generation of robotics, which I call, I and others call killer robots, um, the idea would be that the machines are sufficiently autonomous that not only do they sort of run on their own and know where they are and do all the kind of things that these other technologies I've talked about do, but they can make the targeting and kill decisions without any human interaction. And let me be clear, so far as I know, those technologies are not available yet. And I say so far as I know because you, everybody knows that when we're looking at what we have available, <laughs> that's already the, last, the, the previous generation of technology. So, so either whatever the current you know, state of the art that's about to be released is and or uh, the next generation after that, the goal is really um, to to take the human being out of the equation so that these machines can operate without human intervention. 
Now, there's debates about that, and some people don't like that, and, and, and some people do within the military. But I'm part of, uh, d just for full disclosure purposes, I'm part of a group um, that is called the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. And that is a campaign that is... Um, uh, the oversight group of that campaign is Human Rights Watch, but there's a number of NGOs that are involved in it. And we're very interested in the United Nations, for example, thinking about these technologies the way that it's already thought about technologies like landmines, which are also another kind of um, non-discriminating technology. They just blow up when pressure is put on them. They don't have any ability to tell if it's a combatant or a non-combatant. Uh, and, and, and cluster bombs and laser blind, blinding uh, weapons. Um, we think that this should be put on the agenda right now and that there should be a proactive ban against the offensive use of these weapons. And so this is something that, in fact, is going on at the Convention on Conventional Weapons in October at the United Nations. I and many other uh, academics are going to join with many other advocates uh, to, to speak to countries and to the United Nations about these issues um, as they sort of move forward. And so, so just to sort of give you uh, a sense of this, if you're interested, you Google this stuff, you'll find lots and lots of pieces about this, in particular because a group of famous people recently helped us with an open letter uh, I'm talking about people like Elon Musk um, of Tesla Motors and SpaceX and people like Stephen Hawking and others gave a lot of, uh, got a lot of press attention that we had this open letter from more than 2,000 people at the end of the day whose main research is either in AI and robotics or, or on the social side of, of those issues and how we're all calling for a ban on, on these technologies. Um, so these are the kinds of things, and this is, this is an article that I happen to write for, from the Ottawa Citizen if you're interested. But, so, th so those are a couple of examples of the technologies where we're trying to take the human being out of the loop. I want to come back now um, and have the last set of considerations uh, by talking about the Watson example um, in the context that IBM invited us to think about it, which is the health context. Uh, so I want to talk about Dr. Watson uh, for the last little bit. And in particular, I want to focus on this notion of human-robot uh, disagreement. Now, what I think we're going to see is that professionals will rely more and more on AI decision-making and that they will do so without understanding the underlying technology uh, that ultimately powers these decisions. Right? So it's an interesting thing. Now, to be a medical doctor, you also have to be a really good technologist, if, especially if you're doing those surgeries, whether on grapes or otherwise. Um, you have to be good technologists. And I think the same is true with the ones who are using software around uh, decision making. Um, but what I think is probably inevitable is that there will be cases of disagreement in the early days where, the, where this sort of fairly successful algorithm or machine system purports that there should be one outcome, but the doctor kind of thinks that there should be a, a different kind of outcome. Um, and we'll keep the human being in the loop, as I've said, for now, because we're more comfortable with the idea that those kinds of checks and balances are in place. So I sort of think of it, you know, Dr. House, right? Um, he's that sort of traditional, goes by intuition and guts. I'm talking about the TV character, some of you may, may know. Uh, and so I'm imagining some doctor, but it, it could take place. It could be a lawyer. It could be an economist. It could be an engineer, depending on which field these decisions are applied to. And they're in charge at the end of the day. They are the human in the loop. And I'm imagining a fairly existential moment that's going to happen in these cases of human-robot disagreement. I truly think of it as sort of being uh, the angst of Abraham. Abraham on the mountain hearing the voice, telling Abraham what to do, and then having to decide, <laughs> do I listen to the voice and sacrifice my own son? Do I follow, you know, uh, what is in my heart? Where do I place my faith? And all of these kinds of things. I think we stand on the precipice of these kinds of existential dis decisions, where the human is still in the loop, where we aren't quite yet ready to trust the machine. It's got a pretty good track record, a better track record than the doctors do, but we still don't know what to do with that because we're letting go of the wheel. Uh, we're letting go of the scalpel. We're, we're, we're allowing the machine to make the decision. And I'm not going to get into the details because I look at this, you know, it's, um, it's a beautiful evening out there and I'm showing you, you know, decision matrices. Um, but but, but my, my colleague Jason Miller and I have sort of thought this through in terms of a fairly simple decision-making situation 
uh, where in this case if you are trying to follow through that matrix which I'm not going to go through in detail but I'll just simply say the D and the U stand for desirable outcomes or undesirable outcomes and so we're going to imagine situations first of all where the robot and the human agree and the outcome is desirable Okay, that's not a very interesting case for, for the purposes of what we're worried about tonight. We can also imagine, and that's, a, that's, that's sort of a, a, a type one situation, we can also imagine cases where the human and the robot ultimately agree and they both get it wrong, right? That's the undesirable one, that's a, a, a type four uh, type situation. The interesting cases are the other cases. Uh, in one case, the human gets it right, and the other case, the, the robot gets it right. And again, not to go through this in much detail, the basic point that we want to draw through all of this is that even when the human gets it right, when Dr. House, you know, stands on the, on the human side of intuition, goes against the machine in the choice making and gets it right, even in that case, after a certain period of time, we're going to say that that decision, just like a lot of Dr. House's decisions, seems to be con contra evidence based. Right? The machine gets it, you know, you saw what Watson does, gets it right every single time, and now you're going to go against that. So what is the basis for this if you can't explain it uh, in, in a way that outperforms the machine's track record? And we're going to see that what ultimately happens is it's the, these hindsight cases become very interesting, not only in terms of the previous question before we got to the hindsight stage of whether or not to delegate, but also to the question that the lawyers deal with, which is always after the fact, which is the question of what do we do now in terms of liability and responsibility. And that's going to be sort of a key thing that comes up here in this context, and both in, this, in the moral sense of that word and in the legal sense of that word. Both of those are going to become very, very important. And I think really what we're going to see is that um, robot liability, if you will, the situation uh, where there's a disagreement uh, and, and the robot gets it wrong, that's going to be in many ways, I used to say a million dollar question, but I guess it's a billion dollar question, right? Human decision making has to have a certain uh, standard of care generally. That's the way the law deals with it. Uh, it it's negligence if it falls below a standard um, that, that sort of, you know, there's, there's gray area around the edges, but we can roughly decide which things fall within the, the standards of the profession, the standard of care, and which things fall below them. That's how we do it with human beings. With machines, it won't be that easy to do that. First of all, because most of the algorithms are proprietary and therefore secret, and we don't know how the algorithm works. And even if we were to, you know, even if we were to compel uh, those, those, those who create um, the, the decision-making mechanisms to be transparent about it in a court situation or something like that, it seems to be that it's not altogether clear that with many of these, the human beings would actually be able to articulate or understand precisely what the machine was doing in any event. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a, a weird thing that we're going to see happening. And, you know, there's lots of good scope for PhD theses on these kinds of topics as we move forward, and I would argue, before we move forward in trying to think our way out of these. And this is a lot of what my own research um, happens to be about. The main point that I've sort of tried to make here is that there's a difference between the undesirable outcomes in the case of humans, uh, when, when humans produce those outcomes, and machines that can't be understood along the same models that we currently have. We have to develop new models. Surely we can make an easy step, as law often does, where it invokes a deeming provision and basically says whoever used the robot, they're going to be the one who's liable. But if we actually think about it in terms of responsibility models, we might find ourselves in this kind of case or this kind of rare irony where the best evidence-based approach was the one that led to this undesirable outcome. And how are you going to pin responsibility if that was sort of the best we were working with in any kind of case? Uh, but ultimately, the whole point is that they can't be understood on the same models. And I'm sort of almost ready to end here with this. Uh, and, and I'll put it to you, though, in a kind of Asmovian paradox. Um, it seems to me that the way that I would say this is that the normative pull that will lead us to a decision to delegate machines, namely the idea that evidence tells us that the machines are better at this stuff than we are, that normative pull will generate a system in which we now have no obvious evidentiary rationale for explaining the outcomes generated by the intelligence machines. All we have instead are hindsight cases. And really, 
we all know that hindsight is 2020. Now, I, I'm hoping that you're not actually I, hoping that you're not thinking that in the last couple of minutes of this, I'm going to, you know, come to some neat resolution of this issue and provide you with a, some sort of plucky suggestion or a proposal, um, because because that's not going to happen. I, I'd be uh, disappointing your expectations in that kind of sense. What I will try to say, just sort of to summarize where I think we're at in terms of what I've said, is that there's a logical impetus that explains really what the Unabomber was trying to tell us. Um, there's a logical impetus for delegating human decision making to machines uh, to the point that we actually drift into a state of dependency on those machines. There's a logic inherent in that and we have to be careful and always be aware of that logic. Um, we have to also uh, recognize that cases of human and robot disagreement generally speak in favor of delegating to the machine systems at least where those machines have a proven track record of success. Uh, and that current models for assessing liability are not easily applicable. I can tell you I've really been thinking through the various different uh, uh, liability models. Just to give you one example as I'm sort of closing off here, um, when it comes to Google driverless vehicles, most of our, our liability uh, law uh, in North America tends to be founded around concepts in product liability. The idea in product liability is based on the idea that whatever that product was that you were sold had a defect or that it malfunctioned. And what I've tried to suggest to you tonight through several examples is that these are not cases of malfunctions in any usual sense other than an undesired outcome. The machine was doing what the machine was supposed to be doing. Uh, it, and so, so, so our current sort of approaches uh, don't tend to work that way. And as I've already said, in the medical context, negligence doesn't follow as a model uh, quite so easily for the reasons that I've articulated. So the conclusion to be drawn from all of this uh, so far from my perspective is really that these are early days. We have a lot of hard thinking to do in order to figure some of these things out. But I would suggest not likely a lot of time to do it. So as I do actually draw to a close now, I guess there's kind of two ways of understanding uh, my title slide. I guess first it could be understood as a metaphor for the coming era of technological dependency in the donut factory that we call human decision making. Alternatively, I guess you could say that it's just uh, another opportunity for me to express my love of robots and donuts. And if you really want to know the answer to which of these is, you'll have to ask my friend Lisa Gannett, uh, who invited me here. Uh, she's sure to know the truth about that. Thank you very much. Ian will take questions now, but be sure to go to the microphone so that the people at home can, uh, can hear. Um, take your turn, line up. I've uh, also been asked to say, um, in the interests of uh, allowing everybody uh, space to, to do this, that um, try to keep your questions sort of, and if they're comments, we'd lo love to hear them too. I would certainly love to hear them. But, you know, we'll try to keep them to a minute or so and allow uh, time for response, uh, especially because there might also be people online who are trying to do this. But please, thank you. Go ahead. Thanks for a very interesting and somewhat scary talk. And um, couldn't help noticing the pronoun we was used a great deal. And I know a lot of the science fiction scenarios are it's the robots versus the human race. But the technology so far is not affecting all humans equally. And I wonder whether that's a nuance that we really also need to pay attention to. And also the fact that the decision making seems almost certain to be beyond the scope even of most of us in this room, that it's a pretty, I don't even know who gets to make those decisions that you're talking about, but I doubt that I have much say in it. Yes. So, I, could you speak I, I to the we? I just leave that as, a, as an important comment that I absolutely 100% endorse, and often that we is used in a kind of rhetorical uh, space, but you're absolutely right. I mean, to me, one of the important points that I hope came across as a main message of this talk um, is that it, it, if, if nobody else does anything, if nobody else does anything, manufacturers will be the ones who make all of these decisions uh, at, at the expense not only of consumers in the usual sense of that word, but I think in the sense of citizens and the inclusive range of citizenry that you're talking about. So it's an absolutely crucial point that you've made. 
Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering about when in the beginning you were talking about that those robots or whatever, they all extract information from, let's say, medical journals and can do that much more efficient than any human being. Um, still, the information that is in those journals obviously is put there by human beings. And the way um, the publishing process works right now obviously favors some kind of information being really dominant in those journals versus other kind of information really being lacking. Do you see any way how that could be accounted for, um, that a robot at one point gets what human doctors sometimes are called, they have some kind of sixth sense, some kind of intuition, know whom to listen to even though their findings are not in a journal for whatever reasons? Well, you're Thank right, you. and so, so uh, you know, obviously as someone who's external to the company and to the project, I don't know exactly how the team that operates with Watson does so. They're in partnership, uh, for example, on the cancer issue with Sloan Kettering, uh, a famous American uh, cancer institute, uh, and, and others. And so um, I think certainly that they've been very careful to use um, what one might describe as appropriate uh, information in the sense of what I think you're talking about, which is information which is just vetted, um, whether it's through a peer review process or something else, as opposed to just somebody blogging about something and, and, and not knowing. That will be, of course, a huge challenge as to, as, as to how to do that. I think, so if you remember when we saw Watson just playing Jeopardy, you would see sort of three answers and there would be a bar with each of them, which they, they, they sort of um, use the metaphor of a confidence level there in that kind of thing. And I think one of the big challenges here will be how does, one, how does Watson come to assess the quality of the information? Uh, um, but, but it's certainly something that we already see, whether it's just, again, going back to my other example of Google-based searching, et cetera, that there is something in the way that some of these algorithms work in the context of big enough sets of data that they do tend to pay less attention to the theory and somehow the algorithm works it all out and when it works, it works, and when it doesn't, it doesn't. But I, for one, uh, tend to agree with you that this is just another wrinkle in the idea that although it's evidence-based in terms of its outcome and its record of success, it may not be evidence-based in the sense of being based in evidence in the ways that we are usually uh, aware of. And I think that's the concern you raise. And I think that's the one which I share with you. But I wonder what um, populations will think if that machine system just somehow is good enough at at getting the kinds of outcomes that people want to, to see out of them. I think that's going to be a real set of challenges in this space. It's a good question. Hi. Um, one of the things that I've worked in some of this stuff, and um, at the moment, most of your medical decision-making machines can usually uh, get to a good house officer, but that's as far as they get. They're usually based on Bayesian statistics, and um, that's as good as we're getting right now, which looks really good to anybody else. It's not really that good. And so why not just carry on using the doctors? <laughs> so that's one. But what the biggest problem with Google cars is not that they're going to knock over some little kid. The biggest problem is that they're always going to drive you past Superstore when you want to just go up the road because they're going to be paid by Superstore to make sure that your Google car goes there. And that actually is obviously the problem we now have with the Internet. It's one we never expected. We thought everyone was going to use it for... I don't know, pure intellect, and that's not what happened, right? So, and it's going to be you know, driving your 16-year-old son past the brothels and so on. So it's going to, it's the biggest problem is not the machines, it's the people we're allowing to make the machines. And as you say, legislation has to be put in place to make sure that they don't go the lines. Now, that hasn't worked so far. We keep on trying to put legislation in place, and then we keep on putting more laws in place that actually allow Google and things to do more, not less. So I don't really see... The problem, you know, I'd say I work on these machines, right? That they're not, I mean, they can be the problem if you allow the wrong people to build them. And that currently is what we're doing. So unless we take a stand, like you're doing, then we will have the machines we all dread. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, your point is to bring in various different kinds of considerations. I think that, you know, the, the compelling yes. one that you bring is sort of the business model that actually underlies... We've got to stop businesses taking control of our, of our future and our technology. They don't need to. We don't need it. We do not need the Scotiabank Theatre. 
-hmm. So when we stop having the Scotiabank Theatre, then we'll know academics are truly independent. When we stop having Google making those cars, then we'll know that we have something that might possibly be safe and actually, actually do us some good. But until we take the commercial thing out of the factor, we're, we're, we're lost. That is my opinion. Yeah, in, interesting comments. I'll, uh, as the next speaker's coming up to the questioner's coming up to the mic, I'll, I'll just mention one other thing. You know, there's been some interesting articles lately that, again, uh, that this is a very different thread of discussion than the one that was just made, which I think is the one that was just made is a very important point. But just to sort of say, there's all these kinds of unanticipated consequences that come with adopting some of these technologies. Um, that, that we just we just never necessarily would have thought about. And what we're starting to see now that. Google, Google still, I think, is claiming that uh, the Google cars have, have logged something over, you know, some number over a million uh, miles without an accident that was caused solely by the, the, the Google car. There have been accidents, but usually there's some human error involved in the accident, as, as we often hear that phrase. But one of the more recent uh, set of studies that I thought was very interesting was that uh, um, a problem that hadn't been taken into account uh, is the fact that Google's cars do follow the rules of the road mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that can, you know, they're, they're, they're programmed to and we can imagine what would happen if they didn't. And that that in fact is causing accidents because other people aren't anticipating drivers who are doing ex everything exactly by the book. And it points to this sort of interesting kind of problem of when technologies in some sense provide a, an ability to perfect things that weren't meant to be perfect. Uh, systems that are meant to be leaky uh, in, in, in certain kinds of ways. And just to give you a different example of that, there's been some very interesting work by an American professor by the name of Woodrow Hartzog and a team of people that he works with who are actually military people from West Point. And they've been doing a lot of very compelling work on um, automating law enforcement. And they provide all sorts of very interesting examples of why it's actually a bad thing to have perfect automation of law enforcement. And why, in fact, there are all sorts of reasons to have some, some leakage and some slipperiness around the edges. It's a different point altogether than, than the point was, that was just being made, but it's also another way of sort of seeing that there's a lot of other aspects of this that come from just rather than just whether the cars make the right decisions in the right moments. There's another question. Thank you. Um, in computing science, there's an old adage that goes garbage in, garbage out. Uh, does a standard exist for the evaluation of the input data to these decision-making systems? Uh, and are you asking about a technological standard or a legal standard? Like, I'm not, which, which end are you it would, interested in? Uh, I guess it would be a standard for quality. How do we know that the information going into these systems is of sufficient quality to make the decisions that, that these machines are making. Mm -hmm. And that, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I know an answer to how we could make it. We, we could have rules that require transparency. Um, we could also do it by, by having these kinds of transportation systems, uh, you know, uh, publicly funded in some way that that could be an actual requirement. I don't imagine, I know any way that we could do that uh, with, with Google or any other company where its success and its entire incentive for building these technologies, uh, re, you know, goes alongside the desire to keep those kinds of uh, things, um, you know, proprietary and not open source, which is what I think you're getting at. Yeah, thanks. So I think I'm not so worried about the, the, these evidence-based uh, robots that you're talking about for two reasons. One is that in many areas, the quality of the evidence is awful. Um, I think when you, th when you talk about chess and, and just content uh, generation, such as what Big Blue did, um, or driving or flying, those are kind of limited spaces in terms of all the possibilities. And it makes sense that machines like that will do better than, than humans will. Um, and, and in many other areas, I think the evidence base is not there. I, I'm, I guess I'm less worried by a system that's so empirically driven. It's really uh, predicting based on a lot of statistical algorithms. I'd be more worried about a robot that can actually be creative that can do a theory of relativity or, or for you as a philosopher that f Ford is way, the way forward in terms of thinking of new solutions for things. That would be a much more frightening prospect to me than this kind of evidence-based, empirically driven statistical 
a kind of robot that you're describing. I just wondered if you could comment on that. <laughs> I'd love to comment on that, but do you mind um, sort of giving a little bit of a window into why, why that would cause concern for you? Um, well, because then I think we're talking about a ro robot much more as a sentient being that has some sense of a theory of mind and uh, that can go beyond the evidence okay. to really forge in new directions. Right. I didn't know if that's the direction you were heading because yeah. we actually have some pretty interesting um, software that can generate uh, original art and can also generate uh, imitation art in ways that are, are pretty interesting. I'll just give you a couple examples so that we can then talk about the rest of your question. But there's um, a, a professor by the name of um, David Cope at University of California, Santa Cruz, and he's a musicologist. And he's developed a program that composes music. And what he's trying to do is basically pass a musical Turing test. Mm. What, he, what he's done, first of all, he, he has the machine sort of um, create music that is, you know, in, in at least a copyright sense, would meet the requirements of originality. Um, whether it would in an artistic sense is another thing. But, but what he's purposely tried to do is to also have those same machine systems imitate classical masters. And then what he does is he runs tests with, um, you know, sort of some of the greatest composers and living composers or, or people who are most expert in particular historical composers to see if they can tell the difference, which one is the original, which one is, is you know, the variation. And, uh, and the machines have done incredibly well in that kind of thing. And that has excited, in the context of, of intellectual property law, it has excited certain intellectual property uh, uh, um, professors to start thinking about who owns copyright in that music, is there copyright, what does it mean to be creative, you know, all of these kinds, kinds of things. But, um, but I guess what I want to say in response to that is at least where we're at with those technologies um, would be in parallel to what you're suggesting about the evidence-based ones. In other words, even though um, we might be fooled into thinking that a machine did or did not generate a particular composition. What we're not fooled into is in any way sort of thinking that they're a sentient being, um, you know, who's making rights claims. Now, this is the stuff philosophers tend to love. And in fact, I've been really careful over the past decade to try to resist that tempting and very fun question that people who do philosophy of mind have thought about for, 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 for decades. Um, um, and the reason is simply because I think we actually have these on the ground questions that are much nearer term than questions about a point at which a machine will uh, try to convince us in a way that we're pretty close to believing that they're sentience or, or, or those kind of things. So for what it's worth, I'm actually less worried about those things, although I, uh, I, I'm starting to see machines do things that, that we would describe as creative. Um, and I'm more worried uh, about these things because I think there is a kind of transference that people are willing to do where if they see that Google car, and, and really the first time everybody sees that thing, well, I can't speak for everyone, but speaking for myself, you see, and Google, you know, they, they make the video in the right kind of way, right? So they take particular people who otherwise wouldn't be able to drive and they put them in, the, you know, and they have the music and all of that sort of thing accomplished. But, but to just see the machines do some of these things you know, especially with that rhetorical package that it's wrapped in. There's a kind of magic there that once people think that, I think a lot of people who aren't, let's say, in the medical sciences profession um, would be tempted to, to, to uh, have a, at least the affectation of trust, if not some kind of genuine trust, about letting those machines make medical decisions. So maybe part of what we're arguing about, or what we're not arguing, but, but what we're talking around is a set of questions that we're not quite ready to entertain because the technology is not quite there. To that, I want to make a very particular response. And that is, I think if we sort of track some of the changes that have been happening, uh, because there was a long period of time at which um, even narrow people working in the narrow space of AI, not generalist AI or anything like that, we're not making very much headway. But we're starting to see things now that tell me we should be at least exploring these questions. And so maybe it's also a bit rhetorical on my part to make it as though that's my immediate worry, um, that this is, this is a decision we have to make now. So I, I recognize that there's a bit of rhetorical flair in that, but I think I'm genuine when I say that in, in, in response to that, that, that we, we are starting to delegate more of these tasks to machine. We're more comfortable with them doing these kind of things. 
And so if it does happen to be the case that they get a little better at their track record at making some of these decisions so that it's no longer at the level that you just described, but even slightly better, where there's advances that are not in the sort of uh, cognitive or in intellectual space, but let's say the mechanical space of how cars perform, et cetera, et cetera, I am worried we're going to go down this road. It's a very so, long-winded so, answer. Sorry. Well, just briefly, I don't want to take too much time, but just on, the, on where the evidence is awful, I am a physician, so um, I, I love the, the use of the medical examples, uh, and, and I'm not that current on, on the literature, but uh, my understanding is that these systems do very well once the problem has been sufficiently distilled for them. Um, and the hard part is still at the beginning in terms of that first 30 or 40 minutes with a patient when you're really trying to figure out, you know, is there something underlying here? You know, they say, well, I'm not feeling that well. And then you're thinking, you're, you're thinking about, you know, there's something psychosocial going on or whatever. So is that still true that they are still these, these systems? Uh, you know, and again, most things in, in the human body are not explainable. So there's, these empirical models are just not going to work that well, even if they are distilled. But is that still true that at the general kind of beginning thing, it's still the big stumbling block for these systems? I, I do think that's true. And, and, you know, the space that I work in, of course, is the legal space. And I would have the exact same set of reflections as you, and I would have the exact same set of concerns with you about the front end of what a lawyer does in terms of framing a problem in a particular way. Uh, because especially in the case of litigation, how one frames the question is ultimately going to decide or, or be important to the outcomes. And I think the same is true in medicine, right? How you frame whatever it is you're doing in the diagnostics will take you in one direction as opposed to another direction. And, and I agree with you, yeah, that, that I, do, I, don't, I don't think they're there yet, which is precisely why IBM wants to think of them as tool-like and something that's in the physician's tool bag along with so many other things. But what I also see as someone who has been a patient uh, in, in a healthcare system is that there are, there are great doctors um, who work along the lines that I think you are describing, and there are many who also follow protocols, which are very much automated versions. You know, it's not an intelligent machine sitting there, but it's something that, you know, a particular doctor looks up in a pharmaceutical, ba you know, in a thing and then just follows a protocol. So, I mean, in, in some ways, we're already automating some of that decision-making uh, in a way that leads to more trust for these kinds of things. But I agree with you. It requires a lot of imagination to think of these machines um, as taking over those roles. And that was something I never, I hope it didn't come across that way, I never intended to suggest that they would take over um, all of the roles of physicians or lawyers or something like that. I don't think that's what's important here. What's important here is whether at any stage in the process they are engaged in key decision making that has effects on uh, people's outcomes. I think we have just about probably six minutes or seven. Five okay, or six. I'll try to be quick. Okay, sure. Um, so I, I worry if there might be, that there might be a little bit of excess sensationalism around some of these issues. So in the same vein of quoting Nietzsche, when you're kind of nervous about talking to a lot of people, sure. Nietzsche said, first you do too little, then you do too much. And I worry if right now we're not doing too much. So. I'm certainly on board with assigning moral status to machine actions or machine agents. But then I wonder if they really deserve a different moral status than the one we already have. And I wonder if, if they even deserve a different one, how much that difference really is. It seems to me like the difference between a killer robot and a young, adrenaline-addled, uh, possibly stupid uh, soldier isn't, is really so much. Just like I wonder if the difference between a uh, Google car and um, uh, a young, possibly bad driver or an old, fatigued driver is really so much. So I wonder if you think the difference is significant or if it's really just the same old moral problems and legal problems we've been solving, but just in new, with new clothes and a new context. Yeah. I'm, I'm tempted to resist drawing straight analogies of the sort that you're doing at the end of what you're saying there. Uh, for the reason, I'll just give the example in the killer robot scenario. Uh, I, I think what's important that's going on there isn't based on kind of a functionality where you can just substitute the functional equivalence of what a soldier does with what a machine system does. Because to me, the question at the end of the day that we need to address there is uh, when it comes to decisions of life and death and who kills and who doesn't kill and whether those things are justified, whether those things aren't justified, um, those have always been 
human decisions. I'm not quite ready uh, to, go, to go down the road of saying that those are just completely <coughs> equivalent uh, uh, just by virtue of the fact um, that you can, uh, to use, I think, the strategy you were using, in essence, dumb down, and I, I use that really in quotations um, because I don't want to think about um, those two examples as necessary, like not all young drivers are dumb or stupid, not all soldiers obviously are adrenaline enraged or stupid. Uh, and in fact, what's interesting is what we see in the killer robots debate. Um, one of the largest support groups is both people for in the military and families of people in the military. And that's because at least a lot of them, at least from their own perspectives, are invested in the fact that part of what they're doing has an ethical dimension to it. And they abhor the idea that a machine would just do that, a programmed machine would do that. So I'm a little resistant to those kind of things. And then just to the first part of what you're saying, um, which was about moral status, again, I hope that I didn't ever suggest that I wanted to attribute moral status uh, to any of these uh, machine entities. I actually started my career in thinking about this in 1997, I think it was, when I was commissioned by the Law Commission of Canada to answer a question, which was a very, uh, compared to what we're talking about tonight, a very superficial kind of question, but, but with deep implications, I think. And that is the question, can computers enter into contracts? So just to situate that, that was at a time uh, when we were starting to recognize that people wanted to do electronic commerce, they wanted to do commerce online in ways that are hard to imagine that we ever thought differently at this point for, for, for at least people who do that, who are engaged in those kind of practices and who live in this space and, and work in that world. Um, but, but it was a really important set of questions because Doctrinal contract law, as I learned it as a law student, was founded on the notion of agreement, was founded on the notion, notion that people came to a meeting of the minds uh, in terms of what these things would be. And how could you imagine either two computers or a computer interacting with a human being as coming to some kind of meeting of the mind. So contract theory and doctrine didn't really work to allow those kind of transactions to happen in a way that law would recognize and enforce. So some of the early work that I did proposed ways of treating the machine system in a way that the law could recognize, which wasn't to give it any kind of status, personhood or even something less, but was in, in, in essence to treat it as what law thinks of, which is a very different way than philosophers use this word, but what lawyers think of as agency. And so um, it, traditionally and historically an agency, you didn't have to be considered a person in law. Uh, minors who weren't considered persons in law uh, could transact on behalf of people as their agents. And the same was true in ancient Rome uh, with, with people who were deemed to be slaves. And slaves also did a lot of commercial work on behalf of their owners. And could be treated as such through this instrumentality in the law. So there are ways without giving or treating machine systems as having anything like a moral status or a personhood type status that we can solve some of these problems. And I'm not, a, as I say, uh, for many of the reasons that were actually made in, in the comment before uh, when, the, when, when, when the person who was asking the question said, you know, there's something sort of presumptuous here in talking in the language of we and that all of us do this sort of thing. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not of the view uh, that we need to go down the road of worrying about robots as having personhood or rights. There's a lot more questions right here and now um, about how they affect various groups without having to go down the road of giving that kind of status. That's what I would say to that. I think there's two more questions. Hey, so yeah, I loved your talk. Thanks for presenting it. Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak to the specifically, uh, the legality of who is responsible if a robot, uh, autonomous robot makes a decision that results in an undesirable outcome. I'm wondering if it's not so simple as with say self-driving cars, you go into it as a consumer uh, knowing that if I let this car make the decision, it will have, as you mentioned earlier, like the over a million miles without a creating an accident. So if I were a consumer to buy that car, I would sort of be signing a contract to, or signing a waiver to say, I'm responsible for any outcome of this car that might do without my decision making. Um, because you know that odds are it's going to be 99% safer than anything you could do. So in the example you gave of uh, the tunnel dilemma, as a consumer, wouldn't you just be okay with saying, yeah, if there is an inevitability of an accident that I won't have made the decision to make it happen, but knowing that it's far less likely than when you were driving, isn't that 
attractive? Yeah, well, so, so there's only sort of three or four um, you, you, sort of obvious suspects here that we can pin the liability on, right? We could we could pin it on the users. I actually think, you know, that's classically what ha what's happening in the internet space now, right? Like every mistake that's made when, when people, you know, in, in the context of, let's say, just one example, the so-called revenge porn, uh, but in but in in, con in other contexts, what do we do? We we blame the so-called stupid user, like it's their fault because they got into this, they went into this knowingly, and so anything that they do, they should be thought responsible for. I'm really, I really push back against that kind of notion. Um, I'm quite certain that lobbyists will push to have this ultimately. That kind of model works very well because then the manufacturers aren't responsible. And the manufacturers are saying, look, why would we build these systems if we're going to ultimately be liable every time something like this happens? So, you know, there's, there's several models. And in fact, I'm not as interested personally, as it, as it turns out, this I'm just telling you an autobiographical tidbit, I don't spend my days worrying about which is the right liability system because I think there are deeper questions to answer. I think th those questions need to be answered as well. Um, but to me, I could imagine, for example, a better system would, would be the kind of system we have in some places already in automobiles where, where, where if we're going to do it that way, why don't we talk about no fault altogether and have a, a compensation pool that sort of covers everybody. But I certainly, for whatever it's worth, do not like the idea that, that all of a sudden the end user has to sign yet another standard agreement where in order to use the product, the only choice they have for inclusion in whatever the activity is, they have to assume liability. That's the model that prevails now and I, I stand against that model for what it's worth. Uh, I kind of had a comment and a question. One was with the Google Cars that if you, if they're following the rules of the road, and as in Canada, you can do right on red, then a lot of pedestrians are most likely to be hit, unless you change the laws either for the pedestrians or you get rid of the right on red. So at the moment, and that's kind of an example of how a lot of our laws don't seem to be, at the moment, have a lot to do with a using AIs or anything in them. And that would make it, if someone did have a Google car in Halifax and went to the Bell Road Junction on Bell Road and I think Spring Garden, um, that there would be pretty much quite a few accidents um, with a lot of high school students who aren't looking and aren't expecting to have to try and dodge a car who they think would have stopped. Um, my question was that in terms of with some of the medical stuff, especially if you're trying to diagnose a psychological problem, a uh, lot of people would argue that having access to private information would mean better chance of a better diagnosis by a machine. Now, I personally would think that private information is meant to be private and not shared, including to a computer and whoever designed that computer and the company that owns the rights to that computer. But do you think that companies will start, if in the, they're in the medical profession, will start asking for more and more private information so their machines can try and come up with a better answer? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, to your first part of your thing, which was a comment, I'll just leave it at that. I agree with you. We're going to have to, if, if, we, if we start to have these cars, we're going to have to think about a lot of driving norms or whatever the the field is and we're going to have to do some law reform. I agree with that and I'll just leave that at that. In, in answer to the question that, that you pose, I absolutely um, uh, think and am concerned uh, about the privacy considerations that you raise. And I'll give you an example that I, I think I wrote about it in 2002 or 2004, but, but in essence one of the early developments uh, in the field of software robots, which people sometimes just call bots, um, was the development of um, a set of uh, tools uh, called buddy bots and I, I think actually Lisa uh, uh, referred to that in, in her uh, opening remarks to me but what these are are avatars um, that work along on the instant platform message so think Siri but then now pull it back a decade and it's, it's, it's a bot that's out there that people interact with by typing back and forth with it instead of now we have, now we have voice recognition that's part of this process. So there was a particular bot that I was uh, doing some, some, some research on that was called, uh, a company was called Active Buddy and the bot in question was called L Girl Buddy. 
And El Girl Buddy had this, you know, sort of typical avatar that teenage, um, um, young, young teenagers uh, would have been uh, attracted to and would have, you know, all sorts of stereotypes built into, into the, the, uh, um, the, the public and personal avatar as it was presented. But at the back end, what it was doing, it was, it was basically what's called a chat bot so that you could talk with it. And El Girl Buddy's main purpose in life, truly, was to drive traffic to El Ma There's a magazine for young people called El, El Girl Magazine instead of El Magazine. And so, so El Girl Buddy would talk with, it was supposed to be at least 12-year-old uh, girls, but it, but it was often very much younger girls and interact and have these conversations. And some of those conversations were getting to the point like where just like people play with Siri now and you know anybody who's played with Siri knows that you can get hooked into that kind of thing. This is something that Joe Weizenbaum recognized in the 1970s when he wrote a book called um, um, Computing Power and Human Reason. And in that book he had developed the first chatbot its name was Eliza. And Eliza was being used, um, it was modeled on Rosarian, this is a very long-winded answer to your question, but I really want to make the point here. It was modeled on Rosarian, Rosarian psychology and it asked these open-ended questions and people would emote back. And the same thing with El Girl Buddy, it would ask these questions and people would type all this stuff in. And the, the way that that bot gets better and better at interacting with you is by having more information about you. And if you read the fine print in the agreement that you click I agree to when you interact with that or, or other other bot bots and Siri is no different from this really. They're better and better. They're more useful to you. They can do more, th you know, they can remind you about your groceries if they know what you want, uh, all of these kind of things. And what we start to see in fact is there's this interesting sort of corollary that goes on where on the one hand you, you gain some kinds of utility by sharing more and more and more information. But on the other hand, there's these disutilities, privacy being among the main ones, where you know this is terrible for privacy. Um, but at the same time, people are so hooked on the benefits that they can get that they're willing to sacrifice their privacy or they seem to be. Now, I don't think that's because people don't value privacy. I think it's because they're putting their salience on other things through techniques um, that the people who design these uh, in a field called affective computing where we're trying to sort of put the emotionality into the machines. I think that's sort of what's going on there. So yes, I'm very worried about um, the way that big data uh, affects our privacy and the way that it's collected in ways which are clearly a trade-off against other utilities that we might really want. I think that's going to be a huge problem in the next decade. I okay, think that um, thank you. the organizers are asking me to call it, but uh, thank you for that question. Thank you to everybody else for all of your questions.